Give me liberty and give me a net. Welcome to Annette on Life, Liberty, and Happiness, a podcast where we talk about the Constitution, history, politics, and pretty much anything else I want to talk about. And you can find this podcast on AnnetteTalks.com, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and if you want to see the recording, go to YouTube forward slash Annette Talks, and you can find it there. And today I want to talk about something that's been bugging me for a little while now, and that is that the media seems to be presenting nothing but doom and gloom on um, COVID-19 and how these new cases are are popping up. So I wanted to bring in John Ziegler. Hi, John. Hi, Nat. Because you're one of the few people that I see that's actually saying, hey, why don't we look a little more deeply at the numbers? <laughs> All right, and you are on Twitter at, at Zygmunt, Zygmunt Freud right? right. <laughs> and on Facebook, and you write for Mediaite. Um, and in your recent articles, what kind of drew my attention to this, because I've been thinking about it, um, but your article talks about how the media is really jumping all over a lot of these spikes that are happening in various states like um, Arizona, Texas, Utah, and California. Is California another one of those? Mm-hmm. ones that have been relatively low numbers and are now starting to see some spikes. And and so um, governors are starting to want to close things down again. And um, your article sa- is called The News Media's Antiquated Obsession with New Virus Cases is Stunting Our Recovery. So you've been following the numbers pretty religiously, haven't you? Far more than I should have. My <laughs> my my three year old and my eight year old are are not very happy about it because uh, they they see daddy on the on the phone all the time. But uh, yeah, I, I I've gotten actually pretty tired of the whole thing because it's it's a very depressing and arduous uh, process. But I, I just don't trust the news media to properly interpret this data set that is really, to be clear a really horrible data set. I mean, just from a a numbers standpoint, you really couldn't imagine a set of data that would be worse for trying to interpret what's going on for a lot of reasons, one of which is uh, there's an enormous lag time from the time that someone actually uh, gets the virus to the time that they realize they have the virus, to the time they decide to get tested, to the time they get tested, to the time they get the test back, and then to the time that there's a resolution of their case. I mean, it is an extremely long process and you don't know at what point in the process any particular data point has occurred. And that's just one one of many, many big problems with the data. I, I said from the very beginning, one of my greatest fears in this whole thing was this data was, is so easily cherry picked by people with an agenda. You can look at this data and find almost anything you want. And because the media obviously has always an agenda for uh, doom and gloom, and, you know, if it, if it bleeds, it leads, uh, you know, then, um, and then let's be clear that most media members are a bunch of morons to begin with. So, so this was really a, this data set is a perfect storm for people to misinterpret things. And the, the new case data point, the, the statistic the media likes the most is really just a- absolutely ripe for, for this kind of misinterpretation because there is a whole spectrum of what that means to test positive for coronavirus. There's literally everything from, wow, I didn't even know I had it, to, you know, you end up dying from it. And then, and by the way, while we're at it on the problems with the data, it, 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 most people know this, but it cannot be emphasized enough that our definition, because of the CDC uh, rules on this, for a death is if you die of or with coronavirus. That is such a huge, massive uh, uh, fact that I think everyone needs to understand because when when we see 130 whatever thousand deaths allegedly uh, is the, is this, you know, because I'm, I'm still not convinced we know the specific number. Uh, it could be higher than that, it could be less than that. But I, I, the idea that we have the, the specific numbers nailed to the to the single digits is is absurd from a data perspective. But but the idea that there's that people don't fully understand the magnitude of with or of 
coronavirus is is shocking. I, I would love to know how many people actually have died of coronavirus, where that was the only thing that caused them to die, or even the primary thing that caused them to die. My my gut feeling is that that number would be much, much, much lower than uh, than 130, whatever thousand it is. And, and the proof of that, by the way, is the average age of the people who are dying, which we are not even able to discern from the data. That's how bad the data is. I mean, you would think that the first one of the first most important statistics would be, OK, how old are the people who are dying when they die? And we don't know. We have an idea. We, have, we know in certain states, a very few number of states actually provide that information. But nationwide, as shocking as it is, we do not know that number. It is impossible to discern from the data sets that we get how old the average or median person is who dies of or with coronavirus. And what we do know, it's very old. Uh, we do know that it's at least 80. Uh, in, in Massachusetts is one of the few states that's very transparent about it. it their average age is 82, uh, which uh, their median age, if you know anything about statistics and you just use basic logic, their median age has got to be higher than 82 because, uh, let's face it, most people, you know, almost no one lives to over 100. So there's there's no one living to 130 that's going to skew the, the average in the top direction. But occasionally someone might die at 35 and that skews it uh, in the lower direction. So the median is always going to be a little bit higher. So So the bottom line is, the, the, mo the normal person who dies is somewhere 80 or above uh, in, in America. And I'm sorry, that is an important statistic. That is very different, very different. First of all, it's very different than the 1918 flu. Uh, people don't, you know, they, people make that comparison all the time. In 1918, it was younger people who were dying, not older people. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, that is a significant statistic uh, for a number of things, by the way, uh, especially if you're going to debate reopening schools, uh, that, that is a huge factor. I'm sorry, uh, you know, something that, that, that directly uh, impacts people over the age of 70 is not that significant when it comes to opening preschools or, or grade schools or even high schools. Uh, I mean, so, um, so anyway, I, that's off on a tangent, but I, I do watch the data very carefully, and it's a very frustrating process for many of the reasons I just stated, but I cannot overstate just how bad this data is in so many ways. I mean, it, it's it's kind of like, uh, you know, I, I must imagine uh, Lindbergh when he was flying across the Atlantic, you know, with almost no eyesight, uh, you know, not being really able to tell what the heck's in front of him and having almost no no reliable data sets. And, and I think a lot of people have made mistakes. I've made mistakes. Uh, I've made a few uh, wrong predictions on this. And I, you know, I'm, I'm already being criticized for the column that you you um, cited, which was picked up by the New York Post and by Real Clear Politics for, uh, for something that I didn't even say. I mean, I say in that column, I expect that the number of deaths per day are, is going to go up a little bit in the near future, which it has done in the last few days. I specifically, and I've tweeted that numerous times. It's going to go up. It has to go up a little. My whole point of this is that there, there is a now fundamentally new relationship between what it means to be a new case and how that relates to death uh, than there was in March and in April. And so my, my, my premise, and this has been backed up by a lot of people far smarter than and more educated in this than I am, uh, and in the medical field, that while we will have an increase, it's not going to be anything close to what it was back in March and in April. And I still believe that. I'm a little concerned by some of the numbers that we're seeing, but I, I still do not believe that we're ever going to see in the near future, uh, you know, deaths go over, say, a thousand deaths a day again. Um, because it had, gone, it had gone down to just barely over 500 before it started to go up again the last few days. Uh, and then be, be clear, you know, Tuesdays, Thursday, Tuesday through Friday is always the worst days for reporting. So, you know, hopefully we're going to see in the next couple of days the normal weekend dip. If we don't, then, you know, I'll be I'll even be more concerned. 
Um, so it, it's not a situation where this is over. This is not over. Uh, it's not. It's not a situation where it's not serious. It's absolutely serious. But the level of fear and panic is completely overblown. And it's and the main reason I wrote the article and that is I saw the handwriting on the wall that we're in the midst of making a lot of really important decisions. Uh, we've already referenced schools, sports. We've seen it this week where essentially college football is done. Uh, mm-hmm. That's not going to happen, even though they're still pretending that they might try to do something. Uh, I think I, I think schools are in big, big trouble uh, as far as a five day a week normal uh, kind of routine. So th- and there's all sorts of decisions being made right now based upon the atmosphere, based upon the the media's. And let's be clear, the media doesn't seem to either understand or care about this. Media coverage influences these people dramatically yes. because it creates or 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 eliminates political cover. If the media was saying, hey, things are looking OK, where death rates way down and, you know, new cases could actually be good news if this is if these are asymptomatic and people are becoming immune. If they were painting that picture, I guarantee you that this, the situation for opening schools would look a lot better because the people making these decisions are normal, everyday people. They're influenced by the media around them. And everyone needs, especially in this atmosphere, Political cover. You need political cover for what you're doing. Uh, I mean, I mentioned football. I, I knew, and I predicted this months ago, the Ivy League was going to be the first league to bail because they're the, the bunch of wussy, liberal, elite academics who hate football, and they want to show the rest of the world how smart they are. But the problem is that actually matters. And the reason why it matters is because every other college president looks up at the Ivy League and goes, oh, my gosh. The really smart guys say they can't do this. We can't do it either. It eliminates their political cover. Because if the Ivy League, had, in theory, said, yeah, we can do this, then everybody else would have said, oh, well, the smart guys said it was OK, so we can do it too. Well, now that's gone. And then it has a domino effect yeah. in reverse. And we saw it in the spring. The Ivy League was the first to cancel their basketball tournament. And boom, within 48 hours, the whole world was canceled. And uh, we're going to see the same thing happen uh, with the fall. And it's and, and these decisions are being made by a very small group of people who I do not believe are qualified. I, I don't believe that they have uh, the best interests uh, of anybody at heart other than themselves. Uh, and I do believe that they're a bunch of liberal academic wussies uh, who have bought into this narrative. And, and frankly, if we weren't in the middle of a presidential election year, and if Donald Trump wasn't on the ballot, I, I do think a lot of these decisions would be different. Yeah, it, it, because I can't really think of any other reason offhand why I'm getting some feedback. I don't know what's going on, but um, I don't know why the, they are sticking with this narrative. And not only are they sticking with the narrative, but people are hearing the narrative and buying into it. You know, the ordinary people not you know they watch the news and they just see the numbers going up and and that's it and they stop there and so i don't i don't understand why so many people like embrace that climate of fear and and cling to it because i'm on facebook all day having people you know being really snarky with me about the fact that i don't want to wear a mask everywhere and and they you can tell that it's coming from a place of fear you know, and so I do not understand why people don't want to see. Like I, I posted this earlier today it's from the CDC, and it's, it shows the death rate. It's down to where it was at the beginning when they first started um, recording this back in March, mid March, and and nobody wants. When I post that, I get responses like, "Well, like what you said in the article, just wait two weeks." <laughs> that's that's what everyone says. Wait two weeks, like they can't wait. To, to prove me wrong, that well, that is going to show me, I'll, they'll show me. Well, uh, you know what? In this case, the situation might look different in two weeks. I do think that this was another concern that I had uh, from the beginning of this, uh, especially living here in California, where the numbers at first were very, very good. I, I said publicly many times, I'm concerned that our numbers are too good right now mm-hmm. because... People always look at, okay, what's the trend or how much is it worse than it was? 
And if you start at a very low number and you go to a number that's still not very high, but it's higher than the low number, people go, oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, um, and and that's happened here in the county where I live in Ventura County. We've gone from basically no cases to a small number of cases uh, and and our and our medical officer, who, by the way, has been completely off in every prediction he's possibly made. I mean, not just a little bit off, but catastrophically, totally off. He's acting as if, oh, my gosh, the sky is falling, which I find to be hilarious, because if when he made these bogus predictions back in early April, if, if we, he, we had told him in July that we're only going to have this many cases, he would have been doing a jig. I mean, because, I mean, because, I mean uh, but, but because we were so low and now there's an uptick, people go, ah, and I do think fear, uh, I mean, it's been proven scientifically that fear uh, screws with people's brains. Um, but I, I, I think there's something deeper than that. Um, I, I've been involved in, in a lot of very controversial stories where there's been damage done uh, that didn't need to be done. And it was done largely because of uh, false narratives. And what I have found, which is an interesting and very frustrating psychological phenomenon, is that once that damage has been done, People are very emotionally invested in that damage having been done for a, a legitimate reason. In other words, they don't, if they've got just gone through enormous amounts of pain and suffering, they don't want to believe it was for nothing or didn't have to have happened. So therefore, the narrative that supports the idea that the pain was justified is the narrative they're going to latch on to. That's actually, from a human standpoint, that is bizarrely, uh, that is bizarrely more satisfying to a lot of human beings. I, I've been in situations where, you know, I, I'm frustrated because I'll say I, I come bearing good news because uh, it wasn't nearly as bad as you were told or maybe it not have been bad at all uh, and that all this was for nothing. And a lot of people immediately, they don't want to hear it. They do not want it they, they, because they went through suffering and there was damage. So they do not want that to be the truth. And so if, you know, that's why, one of the many reasons why there is, plus the fact that the mainstream news media is completely invested in this idea, and as is the entire Democratic Party and the liberal establishment. But, I mean, it, it, there was never going to be a situation where coronavirus was, ended up being perceived as being overreacted to. That was not a possibility. Once we shut down, then it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what it was going to take. And we, and you've seen, I'm sure you've noticed this, Annette, where, you know, they keep moving the goalposts from deaths to, well, no, no, it's not just deaths. Uh, you know, what about the uh, the lung damage that may be done uh, uh, long term or the other side effects or, or you know, and, and by the way, uh, well, yeah, it's mostly old people, but but what about these other side effects that might be impacting children, like Kawasaki syndrome? Remember that for like a week? Kawas <laughs> Whatever happened to Kawasaki syndrome? I mean, they were desperately trying to find something that made this m more catastrophic than it actually was because once they pull the trigger on the devastation, and let's be clear, I, mean, I don't think most Americans fully understand how devastating what we have done already is and is going to be, not just for a short period of time, but maybe the rest of my life, depending on how, how long that is. I mean, it, we have made uh, some, the, the most dramatic decisions uh, of my lifetime. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, once that damage was done, there was no going back. Where no one's ever going to admit, oops, uh, you know, we, we really didn't need to do that. Um, be, because then they're idiots, and and then they're the ones are too too hard are, are to blame uh, for for what really transpired and all this damage that will go on forever. I I will um, look. I, you know, I am an incredibly open minded uh, person, and and I am still open to data that shows me that uh, the lockdowns did something really great. Uh, I have not seen that data yet. Uh, I look for it all the time. I, I, I mean, I'm starting to see a little bit of it. Uh, if the death rate were to go up dramatically from this point, I could, okay, I could make an argument. All right, then maybe the lockdowns did at least delay that. I don't know if they prevented it, but they, they may have delayed it a little bit. But I will say this, and that even if I give the pro-lockdown people 
every benefit of the doubt, every possible benefit of the doubt. In my opinion, they still don't even get close to the kind of damage that would have to be prevented by the lockdowns in order to justify it in the larger picture. I mean, in all seriousness, and, I, and it's amazing to me this happened without anyone ever having this conversation. We never had this conversation publicly. It wasn't in the media. It wasn't in the government. Not one state legislature took a vote on this. This was all done by, by Governor Edicts. No one ever said, gee, okay, as a society, how many lives do you think we need to save to justify what we're about to do? No one even had that conversation. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, in a, in a country of 327 million people, you would have to be talking about saving millions and millions of lives to justify what we have done. I mean, millions. I, I don't know what the no, exact number it is, but by the way, it wouldn't be millions of 82 year olds. I'm oh. sorry. I mean, I, I love you know old people as much as anybody, but I mean, in order to justify what we have done, it would it would have to save an, an enormous number of people and the. There's this zero indication that that's what happened here. I mean, did, did we delay the deaths of, of a few thousand people so far? Okay, probably. Might even be tens of thousands of people. Maybe. I don't know. But we're not even in the ballpark of what it would have taken to justify the damage that we have created. And I'm not just talking about economic damage. I, I'm talking about social cultural damage. I'm talking about health damage. I, 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 in all... And I, I'm sorry, I'm flabbergasted here, but I, it, it, there's a study out, and there's been a couple of different ones, and who knows how accurate they are. But, you know, weight gain among Americans is somewhere between 5 and 10, 15 pounds a person during the lockdown. Let's pretend it's even just 5, all right? Let's just pretend it's 5. Let's pretend every American added 5 pounds during the last four months. That alone... Forget about anything else from a health standpoint is going to be more damaging in the long run to Americans' health than whatever we prevented by the lockdown. I, I truly believe that. I mean, from, I'm talking about from heart disease perspective, from just general, general health perspective. And that doesn't even include you know, the, the increased depression, the alcoholism, the child abuse, uh, suicide attempts. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I don't even need the economic element of this to argue that the lockdown was a complete failure. And uh, I, the division between the two halves of the country, which is getting worse and worse, has, has increased greatly because you have half the country that is where you're at, where like this was totally ridiculous. And, and, and then you have the other half that says, if we just save one life, it's worth it. You know, I'm still getting that. If well, it's, just you know, it's, it's funny, it's funny, Annette, um, you know, as a long time radio talk show host before I do whatever the heck I do now, um, you know, th this that was one of the, the conversations that conservative talk show hosts used to always have when a story would come up in the news and and liberals would say, well, if we can only save one life. And I think a lot of conservatives didn't take that concept nearly seriously enough. Like it was almost humorous, like, you know, oh, OK, that's kind of a silly uh, belief. Well, that's that, that belief that you just cited is driving Everything right now, we went from, no, no, it's just a month to flatten the curve. By the way, it's even worse than save every life. It's now prevent every case. Yeah. What, 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 how, how did we get from flatten the curve to prevent, as if we could, prevent every case? And, you can if we just all wear masks all the time. Well, well, the mask thing, and, and I know you're aware of the, the video that of my speech to the Ventura County uh, Board of Supervisors oh, that yeah. went viral. If no one's found that, they need to go. <laughs> well, yeah. And it, I mean, it's been seen millions of times all over the world. Uh, interestingly, I think it's it's been bigger at, in, in foreign countries than it was even in my own county. Uh, oh. But um, and that was not intended. I, I, I had no expectation at all that anyone other than on maybe my Twitter feed would ever even see it. Uh, but it, it, it struck a nerve. And, and people, I think, misperceive. I, I understand why. If you only see the two minutes of the speech where I rail against them for, for among other things, their mass declaration, uh, when our medical officer for three months said we don't need one. And I mean, he was actually against masks like Dr. Fauci uh, until it became a political symbol of, of virtue. 
Um, my, my view on the mask thing is is much more nuanced than uh, than I get credit for, which we're not in an era where nuance matters. But my, my just for the record, my view is this. Um, I have no idea whether or not masks help in this situation. None. Uh, I, I have seen uh, no evidence uh, that that they do help. I understand why people think that they would help. I mean, logically, I get why it appeals to people. Um, uh, you know, doc, there's a reason why Dr. Fauci and a lot of the experts were against it back in March. I don't buy this idea that they were lying to us. I, by the way, I love, I love this. This blows my mind more than almost anything in this whole fiasco. Is that there are lots of people who have no problem with this explanation. So let, let's just review this explanation that Fauci and others like him gave. No, 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 no. I wasn't wrong. I was lying about the effectiveness of masks because I didn't want there to be a run on masks. Now, 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 can we can we just think about this for just a second? First of all, if you watch the video, which has basically been hidden uh, by the media of Fauci making uh, this uh, opinion very well known, he's not uh, like a hostage. Uh, you know, reading a, a speech, please do not buy masks. Uh, you know, I mean, this is not, he is laughing about masks. He is, he is almost mocking the idea of masks. So it doesn't fit with the lie theory to begin with, but let's just pretend, let's pretend he's a great actor, uh, Anthony yeah. Fauci. And, and, and this was all just a scam. So, so two things, number one, so why are you trusting anything he ever says again after he acknowledges he, he lied? Number two, he was willing to lie in a way that if he's right now about masks and you're right about masks, endangered the lives of millions of people. What? 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 How, how does that make any sense? So anyway, so back to my to the view on masks. So I actually think that there's an argument to be made that masks hurt. I really do. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I've been tweeting it half jokingly, but I'm going to keep an eye on it ever since Los Angeles. Uh, had their mass declaration and California had theirs, our our numbers have spiked dramatically up, dramatically up. I mean, there's been, there's absolutely no evidence at all in the data that, that mass declarations or mandates by the government uh, have worked at all. Now, everyone always says, well, what about South Korea or Japan or uh, some other, and there, there have been countries that have, that have used mask mandates that have had good numbers. But the first day, uh, I don't know if it was the first day, it might have been the second day of sixth grade science class, you're taught that uh, correlation does not uh, mean causation. There could be lots of reasons for that. So, so the best way to de determine this is, okay, look at the data before you have a, a mask mandate, wait a while, and see what does the data show you after a mask mandate. And so far, I have never seen, never seen, please, if someone has it, show it to me, a situation where, you know, the, the, ca the cases were like this, and then there was a mask mandate, and they went like that. I mean, there's no nothing, nothing like that. But even if it works, which I got, even if masks work, and I'm fine with people wearing a mask, you want to wear a mask, that's fine. And if the government thinks that the masks work, go ahead. Tell people they should wear masks. Where I draw the line is that it's a government mandate with a penalty attached to it. Uh, one, because as a libertarian, I don't believe that that's what the government's role is. I think that's a far exceeding the government's authority. And I, and I always ask the question, if the government is able to force you to restrict your own breathing in, can we be clear, a situation that is not catastrophic. We are not in a catastrophic situation. We are not in a situation where it's Monty Python, bring out your dead, bring out your dead. I mean, we're not in that situation. So if the government can force you to restrict your own breathing uh, uh, under these circumstances, what can they not do? Yes. And, and then attached to that, and this is the one that really gets people pissed off when I ask them this question, is, uh, okay, so when does this end? When, by this logic, by this logic, why would we ever end mask mandates? Ever. Right. And, 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 be, and naively people think, oh, John, come on. Uh, this, you're, is this some sort of, uh, you know, new world order conspiracy theory? No, this is human nature. This is the nature of government. And what I love is when people say, well, John, 
what about uh, seat belts in cars? Are you against that? And I say, I, I say, okay, you no. Know, first of all, your analogy is is ridiculous for a number of reasons. But uh, one of which, by the way, is the whole reason the government has the authority to regulate what happens in your cars because they have authority over the roads. They don't have authority over I me mean, walking, you know, on on. on regular old private property and forcing me to wear a mask. So that so so from a, an authority standpoint, the analogy breaks down. I also think it's very different uh, from a from a risk standpoint. But even if I accept it all, here's my point to them. Thank you for acknowledging masks will never end, just like seatbelts, uh, just like restrictions on, you know, smoking because of secondhand smoke, which I'm not a smoker. I don't care about. But I, I mean, my, my point of this is you've just proven my point, which is that if you analogize it to something that's never going away, that was that's an annoyance that people fought a little bit at first, but now just accepted as life. Guess what's going to happen with masks? The same thing. Masks are here forever uh, because, my gosh, and why shouldn't they be? Because every single year. Yeah, there's a flu out what, for every six months, every year. Every year we have a flu bug. So so why would we not be required to wear masks? Mm-hmm. I mean, don't you care about every life? I mean, in theory, in the, I mean, I mean, I, now look, I, to be clear, I, I believe that the death rate, and there are people who disagree with this, who are, uh, who are like on my side of this issue, but I, I do believe that the death rate for coronavirus is significantly higher than the flu. I, I don't know what the exact number is. I think it's at least three to five times as deadly as the flu. Um, and and so, you know, I don't want to give the impression it's exactly the same thing, but it's the closest thing we have to mm-hmm. compare. And the reality is that people die of the flu. And so if we're doing this now, why would we ever stop if this if this is if this is the theory, and you know, I think people are very naive when they say, "Oh, John, once this is over, we'll fight the mask thing." No, you won't. You, 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 you no, no, no. The government has the government has now realized that they can do almost anything to us, and not in a conspiratorial way, just in a. Well, I, I, I here's what. I, last thing on masks, real quick, unless you have another question. I really believe that the Fauci's and uh, you know people like him of the world and the Democrats were late on masks. Because they never thought Americans would go for this. Mm. They never thought there wouldn't be a backlash. And it was only when they realized, holy cow, there, there's not a, not only is there no backlash, we're going to get applauded for this because that's how freaking scared people are. And that's how, how cowed everyone is. And we can make this into a, a political issue that works for us because it's now a signal that you're anti-Trump for all intents and purposes. And Trump, of course, because he has no damn balls, he uh, he uh, you know he's now caved in on the issue almost completely. Uh, and and the liberals won. So why are they ever going to back off on masks? What now? Uh, I, I, I mean, I, not, I certainly. You know what? And, and I, I've analyzed this thing six ways from Sunday and come to most of your conclusions as well. You know, the fact that if you can get everyone to conform in a highly visible way, it's on your face. No one knows if you're washing hands at home, you know, like you're supposed to, or if you're always social distancing from everyone. But they can see immediately if you're wearing your mask. And um, but I, I think one of the reasons it's become so accepted is because on the left, Nobody wants out of lockdown, right? They're they're like, no, 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 let's stay locked down forever and keep getting unemployment checks or whatever. Let's just stay locked down forever. But someone said, well, if we wear a mask, then we can open things up. And so they see that as the uh, sort of um, the what's the word here? I'm always looking for the that's the agreement that we made between the two sides that we will open up if we wear masks. So they feel like we negotiated to that point, and that's what it feels like. I can't think of no other reason why they're they're caving to this because now that we okay, we're opening up, but we're wearing masks everywhere. So when they see someone like me walking around or making an argument on Facebook about not wearing masks, they get angry at me. It's not just well confusion. Why aren't you wearing a mask? It's anger. Like you're childish, you're selfish, you don't care, you want to kill everybody. Like that's what people tell me, and and so it's like we're going back on our contract, you know. But, but see, hold on. Like. First, 
first of all, I don't remember making that deal. Uh, second of all, these, these, that, that's a deal with people who told us it's a month to flatten the curve and now it's uh, it's forever uh, uh, preventing all cases. So I don't make deals with people who already broke a deal with me. I, I mean, I, I made the deal on the flatten the curve thing and, and that deal got broken. I, 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 that cannot be emphasized enough. As, uh, where's the evidence, by the way, that, uh, okay, there's we're getting in the exchange for the mask mandate. I mean, there's there's nothing. Even Kentucky, Kentucky, a state I used to live in, just went to a, a statewide uh, mask mandate. And Kentucky's stats are perfectly fine. I mean, and this is a rural state, a Trump state. It's got a Democratic governor. There, there might be some backlash there, but that was kind of shocking to me that, that even a Kentucky uh, w- would go along with this. And I think it's because the mask people won. The mask people, and this is what happens when you have every element of the news media on your side uh, and fear on your side and mm-hmm. a lot of ignorance on your side. And, uh, and, and when you had a, a population, let's face it, that we have done a very poor job, mostly through our public education system, of teaching about the importance of civil liberties, of, of teaching about the, the dangers of the slippery slope. I mean, to me, this, this is as slippery. I've always felt that this area plus free speech are the two slipperiest of all slopes. And we've seen that in the last few few months. I mean, uh, free speech is is basically gone in a lot of ways. It's sliding uh, down slopes big time, yeah. Yeah, um, and and but but you know we 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 have we are a population that doesn't value those things anymore because uh, we we'd rather have the the you know the the warm embrace of big government to protect us uh, and uh, and and frankly um, you know I think the numbers are now so large in the other direction in the pro government direction that the people who think oh we'll fight back against masks once this is over. Are incredibly naive. I, I, I mean, uh, I, I think that um, in blue, in in very blue states, uh, I see no reason why the mask thing is ever going to end. Ever. I don't uh, either. I've, I've seen people saying already they're going to keep wearing them forever. I thought the little, you know, quiz on Facebook. Well, who's not going to who's going to stop wearing masks or who's going to keep wearing masks? And oh yeah, I'm going to keep wearing them. It's, like, it, it's a virtue signaling thing. It's a fear thing. And yeah, I am I am getting smacked down hard just for saying I don't want to wear a mask. I mean, I wear it if I have to, but the, just the fact that I don't want to is not acceptable to most people, which is, you know, someone said, well, you don't want to be told what to do. I'm like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, does that not matter anymore? We're, it, we're just supposed to conform. Just conform. Shut up and put the mask on and conform. And that's it. He, yeah, it's been very, there's been a lot of depressing elements of what's happened over the last four months. But I think psychologically for me, the most depressing has been the lack of pushback and the demonization of a lot of the concepts that this country was built on. I mean, it was founded on, I mean, we were, found, we were founded on the concept of freedom and liberty and risk taking and yeah. individual responsibility. What happened to rugged individualism? I mean, that- I mean, it's just unbelievable that, that this country could so quickly, I mean, I, I always feared that this is where we were heading. I didn't think it was gonna happen this fast. And then I even, you know, people think of me as a pessimist, which I often am. I actually think of myself as sometimes a delusional optimist because I'm always looking for hope. And I actually thought, you know what? Maybe this is actually happening too quickly, too soon, uh, and that the, the, the liberals are overplaying their hand, which they always do, and then there'll be some sort of a backlash, and that maybe, just maybe, this will actually be good in the long run. But judging from Trump's horrendous poll numbers, n- no, there, there's no cavalry. The cavalry doesn't exist. It ain't coming uh, because uh, too many people have been uh, co-opted and uh, by this whole fear thing and by uh, this notion of government. And, and frankly, Republicans have embraced big government in a huge way. I mean, it's Republicans, this administration handing out twelve hundred dollar checks to everybody. And maybe we're doing that again. By the way, how, how in the how in the future when Trump loses? How in the future does the, do Republicans ever argue against any sort of socialist policy ever again? 
they, they can't. They, 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 we, we just handed checks to everybody. Uh, um, I mean, that's as socialistic as you get. So, um, you know, I, 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 I don't like Trump. Uh, I just, I was against him from the beginning. I blame him for a large part of what happened here because I think he was gasoline on the fire. Uh, I, I truly believe you take every single fact on the ground with regard to coronavirus and Hillary Clinton is president and the left is looking at this completely differently. They're looking at, they, they're looking at this as, you know, this is a bad hand we were dealt. We got to be brave. We got to do the best we can with it. It's not that bad. Uh, you know, that, that's, I, I believe that with every fiber of my being. Now, there would be some Republicans who would be attacking her in, in ways that liberals were. I would like to believe there would be a, there would be a significant number of people uh, you know, in our camp that would still be going saying exactly the same thing that you know she's right or they're they're right this is not that big of a deal we don't destroy our life over this um, and uh, and we and we do the best we can with it uh, and so um, you know I, I do you know it's become a joke now when when does the when does the uh, pandemic end it's November fourth that we already know the date. Um, I, I actually think it's going to probably be January, whatever, when Biden gets uh, inaugurated, because I don't think they're going to want to be quite that overt about it. But um, um, but I do think that there's something to that. I do. Th- I mean, and um, it's it's all it's all very depressing, because even though I hate Trump, I, I was kind of hoping to see some life from his poll numbers just to show that there would be a pushback against all this. And in fact, it's been the opposite. And to me, that has sent a message that is very, very dire for the future of this country uh, with regard to uh, the way that government is now going to be able to do whatever the heck they want um, with because there, there are no lines in the sand. There are no lines. And, and, and we, by the way, we see no lines in the sand on the social cultural aspect with regard to the Black Lives Matter uh, I mean, wh- where's the line in the sand there? there? I mean, there's no line in the sand. I mean, it, it looks, it appears as if we may have drawn a line in the sand at the nickname of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish football team. It appears as if there's there's pushback against that because that's white people. So, so somehow uh, that doesn't count. But that's about the only thing I've seen so far where someone started to, to, to try to create a brush fire and, and it hasn't turned into an inferno. Um, and, and this is, these things are serious because, because once you erode, this is a continual erosion of the foundation and, you know, you're, you're not going to agree with this. I hope, or I don't think you will. Uh, and maybe your, your viewers won't either, but, uh, this is where I get very pessimistic. I, I really believe that this erosion, that the, the end goal of all this, not in a conspiratorial way, no one's in a meeting uh, coming up with this, but I really believe that if I live long enough uh, here in California, we will not have property rights any oh. longer. Uh, uh, I, I think I think that that is where we're headed. I think once you were once because think about it, once you erode uh, all all the founding fathers are racist, and the Constitution means nothing. That means free speech means nothing. That means uh, uh, right to wear bear arms means nothing. In fact, it's actually racist. Uh, and private property rights are, are right there. I mean, that's that's the that's the end goal here. I mean, uh, you know, so and, that's and, the goal. I just no, no, no. Well, well, let, let me don't rep- really rate, get there, well, what, what's, what's what's the number one thing that the extremists and the Black Lives Matter group wants? Reparations. They yeah. want rep- reparations. Now, the argument against reparations has been completely eroded by uh, by by simply the the coronavirus handout checks. I mean, if, you, if you're handing out checks to everybody, why can't you hand out checks to people who, who uh, you may or may not be the descendants of slaves? Why not? I mean, what, there's, there's the, the barrier has been broken now. And so, and then once you give reparations, then, then why the hell should white people be allowed to own land? Why? why? I mean, they, they got it, you know, because of, uh, because of slavery in some uh, shape or form. Um, and, and this is going to sound alarmist to people, but I, I think like in California, I believe that eventually they're going to abscond, there's, there's going to be no concept of private property anymore. I, I believe that once the percentages become such that landowners are enough of a minority of the population where they can get away with it, they're just going to say all land is public, is owned by the state. 
uh, we'll give you the the right to uh, to rent on it. Uh, uh, by the way, that rent will probably be determined by your race, uh, and um, and 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 that'll be the end of it. Um, I, I really I don't know. I'm not. It's not going to happen next year. Um, but I, I really do believe that's where there because there's nothing stopping it now. I mean, the, the train has left the the station, and uh, I, I don't see I don't see where the line in the sand is going to finally be. Everyone always says, "Oh no, 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 well, no, it'll, it'll we'll stop it at some place." Well, where, where are you going to stop it? Where, where are you going to stop it? I mean, I mean, if we're we're not even stopping it at at, at, at Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln, and, and Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, if, if we're not stopping it there, where the hell are we going to stop it? Because once they're gone, forget about it. It's it's there's 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 no place to stop. Uh, um, and and people people are so afraid, and especially white people are so afraid to to, to talk back against it because they'll be deemed racist, they'll be canceled, they'll lose their jobs, uh, and so you know it, it gets it's it's allowed to happen. And these precedents matter; they matter because uh, the, it's the this erosion theory that I keep talking about that one, once you do one thing, the next thing is easier because you're 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 making you're getting more and more traction. And and it, you know, my gosh, I mean, the masks are a good example of this. We didn't, we couldn't have done masks 30 years ago out of the blue on something like this. It took, it took 30 years of erosion. You're not allowed to smoke. You, you, you know, you gotta wear, you can't use a cell phone in your car. You 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 have to wear a seatbelt. Uh, I mean, and and everyone, we go, okay, all right, all right, okay, okay, okay. Now the mask thing doesn't seem that far fetched, far, far afield. And and that's the slippery slope. And that's where I see us going. Now, how long that's going to take, I don't know. I I was hopeful, again, as I stated, that maybe all this happened too soon and that there would be a pushback. But I've seen absolutely no indication. Now, part of the problem is that Trump is a terrible instrument. Uh, um, but uh, I, I see I see no I see no pushback. And <laughs> and that that is very scary to me. Well. On that note, <laughs> I'm sorry to be a downer, but that... you, you, you don't see. Do, do you see where I'm? Do you, do you see? Do you see my argument? Well, of course I do, and it scares the crap out of me, honestly. Which is one of the reasons why I I have all these stacks of books you can't see next to me because I'm going to do episodes on Black Lives Matter, Marxism, socialism, and then I'm going to circle back around and I'm going to do several episodes on the Constitution because people don't understand the connection between the fact that they are ignoring their liberties and what there's an agenda for. And so those two things go together and they matter. I just hadn't gone through the mental exercise that you have and said, well, this is where we're going and this is what's gonna happen in California. But I'm praying, literally praying, that there are enough of us in the country that are gonna say no. And there are enough of us that are gonna say, we're not going to stand for this. Now, if California wants to do this, then we might have to make California another country and say, why don't you go ahead and secede? I don't know. And then everybody else can take off, you know, come to another state. But I, I definitely think what you're talking about is the goal of a lot of people. But I, I am praying and hoping and going to keep speaking out in the hope that that does not happen and that there are enough of us that we can stop this from happening. Either that or a giant meteor needs to just come down and let's just be done. Because I, I, I would rather have that than watch our country go in the way that you're you're talking and that a lot of people want to have happen. Well, on the bright side, once California does it, it will probably take at least a couple of years for most of the rest of the country to follow suit. Mm-hmm. So, so you'd have a couple of years preparation. Yeah. All right, well, let's circle back to the numbers. <laughs> And um, people, you've been warned, all right? You need, you need to start pushing back on some of this stuff that you're caving into. But um, circling back on the numbers, uh, new cases do not equal new deaths. Correct, but let's be clear. I mean, the, the, the new death numbers, uh, they're starting to go up slightly. I think they will continue to go up slightly. I, I will be um, very nervous if the seven-day average uh, gets, say, you know, it's an arbitrary number, but people love zeros. If it gets above a thousand uh, again uh, and is still trending up, that would make me uh, nervous. But can we also, for some perspective, <laughs> please, even if it was a thousand, a thousand people dying 
in a country of 327 million whose average age is at least 80 in a country where, and this is maybe the best stat that I've come up with. I mean, people, when I tell it to them, they always want to know what's the sourcing because it sounds impossible. Um, but this time of year, we lose at least, at least 1,400 people a day in nursing homes. 1,400 people a day die in nursing homes every single day this time of year. And by the way, that's a conservative number. It might be higher than that. And so the idea that, uh, and, 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 and let's be clear, since you're talking about the numbers, I believe that that is partially why we will never go below 400 or so deaths in a day in this country, as long as we keep counting the deaths the way that we are. Because right. think about it's it. Think, think, right, <laughs> th think about it logically. If a quarter or a third of everybody in the nursing home were to test positive for coronavirus and they die, regardless of when they die, that's several hundred deaths a day uh, with coronavirus. So, so there's a baseline below which, the way we're counting, we cannot go, right. at least not currently, with the virus being as prevalent as it is. And so and no one wants to talk about that. I mean, uh, uh, but I mean, for a while there, I, I, you know, when we were at 511 or 517 and seven day average, I thought that might be that's why I, I kept saying it's going to go up, because I thought we were reaching as low as it can mathematically go based upon the, this counting, because there are studies that show that in many populations, about 20 percent of people have this or more. And uh, and so if that's the case with with and, and by the way, it's not just even though you even test for coronavirus, you could just have the symptoms of coronavirus being in a nursing home, die and you're a coronavirus death. So so clearly within that population of at least fourteen hundred people that die every day, there's a certain number that are going to be counted as coronavirus deaths in this environment. Mm -hmm. And so and it's in the hundreds. I don't know what the number exactly is, but it's in the hundreds. And uh, and that's why I would really love, but no one will ever provide this number. What is uh, we should know on a daily basis? What's the average age of the people who died today? And we don't know that. And I, I believe there's a reason why we don't know that, because that number would not fit the narrative that anybody uh, in charge wants to promote. Well, and even the numbers we are seeing, if you, this little chart that I post on my Facebook page, the highest line is the over 80, 85 and over. The, the one that's almost completely flat is uh, zero to 24 years old. So right. even with the, the flawed data that we have, we, we can see that, it, you know, the, the people that are dying the most are the, the over 80 crowd. So, and, and we see that younger people are, die, are, are testing positive now. And that's a, that's a good thing because they're going to be asymptomatic or not very sick. And so it's starting to come to the younger crowd, the healthy crowd. And, and that's a positive thing that you never hear anyone talking about. And what about Sweden? What are we seeing in Sweden? They, they didn't shut down at all, right? Aren't their numbers? Well, you know, the Sweden thing has, has been a classic media uh, uh, manipulation. And, and it, it, Sweden had dared to disobey orders. Uh, by not being run by a government lockdown. And so therefore they needed to be punished. And and to be clear, you know, they made some mistakes with regard to nursing homes early on and they lost a larger number of people than their neighbors did. But since that early mistake, and they decided they were playing the long game here, uh, I believe that uh, they have been at least somewhat if not largely vindicated. Now they're their their medical officer, what they ever they call him there, you know, made some comments that I think were misinterpreted or taken out of context where he admitted making mistakes and somehow this was, aha, we, we proved it. You guys were wrong in doing what you did. Well, if you look at Sweden's current numbers, I believe I looked this morning, their seven day average for daily deaths in the country of Sweden is four. Wow. Four. 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 Four deaths per day in the entire country of over 10 million people, four deaths. Mm -hmm. um, and, and by the way, their cases have been quote unquote spiking for the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, but that's because they've increased testing in a, in a dramatic fashion. So, um, you know, to me, 
Uh, and the New York Times did a hit piece on Sweden a couple of days ago, which I, I read a piece today indicating there were a lot of inaccuracies, shockingly, in the New York Times hit piece on Sweden. But the, the part of, to me that is most um, frustrating about the Swedish thing is as it, is if in this equation, there's no value placed on freedom. None. None. No, it's 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 it, well, you had more deaths than Denmark and Norway. So therefore you were wrong. Well, 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 wait, wait a minute. Hold on. Uh, first of all, uh, you, 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 you had freedom. Uh, you had school. Uh, you, you, you know, your economy got slowed down. Yes. But um, but what about the long run here? You haven't created any horrible precedents. Uh, you uh, you have probably far more immunity of your population uh, than than other countries do. Uh, so so there are other factors here that um, that the, the news media wants to ignore because Sweden committed a cardinal sin. They did not go along with the liberal media orthodoxy, and uh, and therefore they must be punished because we cannot have that. If you go outside the herd, forget about herd immunity. If you go outside the media herd, you will be stampeded and run over because anyone that gets away with that uh, must be destroyed because if you're not, then that means that the media – could theoretically be wrong, and we can't have that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, look, was Sweden perfect? No, but um, you know, we're talking about a still a relatively. They've had just over five thousand deaths again of much older people in a country of over ten million. That's terrible. That's that you know that's terrible as far as you know a lot in life. That I mean, it's a that's a bad hand of cards. Uh, it's a terrible thing. But guess what? Uh, life brings challenges. And uh, and there are worse uh, outcomes than that. I've always asked people, why wasn't Sweden the worst country in the world? Why, why, why weren't they the worst even in Europe? Why weren't they even close to the worst in Europe? Why, why, no one wants to answer. So if lockdowns are so important, why is it Sweden should be clearly the worst? Yeah. And, 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 and there were predictions of utter doom for them that, of course, did not come true. But we've gotten used to that. All right. Well, this has been so happy and sunshiny and lollipoppy. <laughs> I, I do want to end on one positive note. Here in Douglas County, Colorado, we, my, uh, the Tri County Health Commission said they wanted man mask mandate for all three counties. Our county just opted out of it yesterday. All three of our commissioners said we're pulling out of that. Plus, we are no longer going to be part of the Tri County Health Commission. It's going to be the Bi County Health Commission. We're going to set up our own because we're one of the more conservative counties in Colorado. And I think enough of us have made a stink to finally say, we don't want to wear your stupid mask. Don't, I, I sent them the same thing I posted on Facebook, my long list of seven reasons why I don't think we should have a mask mandate. And, and it's usually not good enough, but um, we, we did opt out of it and we are kind of doing our own thing. So, you know, I moved to Colorado in large part to get away from California because of, you know, all the, the obvious problems. Not that it's that much better here, but I'm so grateful to have landed in this county right here where the commissioners are actually listening to the people. And um, so some of us are still fighting the good fight out here. I went to Target today and I was one of three, I think, that didn't have masks on. But I've learned to just not look around, you know, and I stay and I'll go in an aisle by myself. And if someone's there, I'll wait till they leave because I'm not going to make anyone nervous and I'm going to keep doing the... Um, social distancing, right? But I'm not going to conform and put a stupid mask on my face because everybody else is doing it. So anyway. Well, well I'm, I'm definitely looking for real estate outside of California. I might have to look at your county. Yeah. Well, if you're going to do Colorado, Douglas County or El Paso County, that's Colorado Springs, you know, that's where the Air Force base is and everything. So make sure you get the right county. It makes a big difference here. I'm finding out. I didn't know how important counties were until this whole thing started happening. They're hugely important. Yes. Yeah. All right. So what you said you had another podcast last time I was talking to you, you said you had a second podcast in the works. Are you doing that now? Or? Um, well, I still do the individual one podcast. And yes, right. we're, we're still in production on a completely different podcast, which I have no idea when that in, extraordinary endeavor will be made public. But uh, we're still working on it. Yes. Although although, uh, you know, we're, we're you know, we're on, in vacation mode right now. So we'll we'll, but we'll get uh, back in the studio soon. Well, um, I'm glad you were able to take a little time away. I know looking at the numbers is incredibly frustrating. Just living during this time period right now is incredibly frustrating.
frustrating. Um, but if people want to find you, they can find you on Facebook and Twitter at Zig, Zig Z-I-G-M-A-N, Freud, F-R-E-U-D. Um, that's your handle. And then individual one, the number one podcast is the name of your podcast. And that's on iTunes and all the other places. And I know you're on Facebook and you're also at Media Eye. Did I miss anything? You got it. All right. Again, thank you for coming on. And um, I'm sure I'll be bugging you to come on again when I need, um, you know, something depressing to talk about. <laughs> so I, I really appreciated your ask, your um, viewpoint on masks because sometimes I feel like I'm the only one and I'm fighting, a, you know, this losing battle all by myself. But uh, it's nice to know someone else feels the same way. Even if we lose, we will go down together. <laughs> Thanks, Annette. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening to Annette on Life, Liberty, and Happiness. Again, you can find it on podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, and AnnetteTalks.com.